So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Chappell. I'm an architect at Career Builder. Uh, I'm also on the Angular CLI team and I'm here today to talk to you about performance in our applications. We've all been on a site that feels magical simply by how it performs. So before we get started, I'd like to say that while it's not actually magic, our users demand performance from us and we have the tools at our disposal to make that happen. Really high level, these are topics I'm going to cover. I only got 20 minutes, so I'm going to get right to it. Our browsers are extremely powerful. The data and insights they provide into our applications shouldn't be ignored. Here are the first one of those insights around user navigation. It's a little confusing, so let me show you what the data actually represents. Each of those timestamps are points in time that the browser changed what task it was performing. The most familiar one to most of you is the onload event. I'm sure you remember doing document.load events, and I can't get into it right now, but um, these steps can provide you with valuable information to your application. Look at this support matrix. I don't know about you, but I find it comforting seeing that much green. So let's talk about something else. We get from the browser when performance and user timing APIs. This is where we have a little bit more fun. We can begin to see how long resources are taken to come down to the user, and we can begin to create custom event markers and do measurements between those markers. The performance API also has fantastic support. One of its main jobs is to serve as a holding place for both the navigation and user timing APIs. The user API needs a little bit more love, but uh, we lose access to the performance mark and performance measure without it. Now I'm going to go through a couple tools that I use for performance pilot profiling in the browser. The first is PerfMap. As you can see, it gives you a visual representation of different parts and assets that are on your page and how long they took to load, as well as the entire page at the bottom. Performance Analyzer gives you a much higher level of information and it helps break down some interesting slow spots such as time the first byte and how long it took to actually process the DOM. This is where it starts to get really interesting. In these charts, which I know you can't read, um, there's a, you can see the number of requests, how long they took, and the quite a few domains listed, and we can begin to see what culprits are uh, slowing down our performance. I'm not going to read this whole slide to you either, but the thing you should know is that the HTTP 1.1 assets are pipelined, but depending on your browser, the number of connections, usually under 10, this means that you begin to see a waterfall effect with your loading of assets. And this is actually a really good example of that. Um, each of the assets themselves did not take much time to load, but you can see that each of those groupings is blocked by the previous group. But what about HTTP2? Can that help? The answer is, actually, I have something from Akamai that shows that it does. So just from that short little demo, you can see that the time and latency to pull down that image, which is actually chunks of little images, took a third of the time with no latency. So that means there was no lag in the waterfall because it was able to stream everything simultaneously. Oh. There we go. Support for HTTP2 is also pretty strong. Um, there's a couple of browsers that need a little help, um, but luckily IE is going away. <clears throat> and now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, admit it, we're all here at ng-conf. We drank the Kool-Aid. Um, otherwise, why would we be here, right? Um, so now there's, we have some background information on performance. I'm going to jump into some stuff that's Angular specific. Uh, everyone here should be at least a little bit familiar with what the digest cycle is. Um, and this is in 1.5, 1.4 and all the younger versions. And how it loops through the watchers doing its dirty checks. And using Batarang, which another slide that's kind of hard to see, um, we can peek into our application and, and actually, um, without actually modifying our code, and begin to look at the application itself. Um, and what you can see here is that the page that I ran this on had 674 active watchers, and uh, the last digest cycle took 23 milliseconds. And for the most part, those watchers are made up of a couple of different types of bindings. Uh, the first is just a simple property. Uh, the other is a binding for a click event that calls a function. The last is repeating over an array. All of these by their own are not, not necessarily bad. In fact, sometimes it's as good as it gets. But a lot of times, we don't necessarily need to watch the binding as we're expecting everything to change. We could do a one-time binding. Some good examples are when we're binding to CSS classes, functions, or doing a repeat on something that doesn't change, like options in the select menu. 
After making those changes the, and testing the page again, we're now down to 389 active watchers from 674, and our digest cycle only took 7.2 uh, milliseconds down from 23. Obviously, that's a good improvement, but it's just a couple little tweaks. That really pales in comparison to the gains we get from leveraging the work that the Angular team does itself. Take a peek at these numbers. I tested 20 page refreshes with the exact same application in 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and 1.5. Without making any changes to the code, you can see how going to either 1.4 or 1.5 offers huge performance gains. Now Angular 2. Um, I'd really like to use Augury for this, and actually I was very happy to see in their roadmap that all the stuff that I'm using in Batarang, uh, Augury is going to be implementing for us, and it's on their roadmap, so that should make everyone happy. But all of that is just testing when you're developing, and it doesn't really tell us what our users are experiencing. And through looking at how Batarang works, we can discover exactly how to hook into the digest cycle itself, and you can add uh, your own arguments to watch and time that data. Um, and you can see here that I'm actually just using the performance API to trigger start and end points between, um, before and after the digest cycle, and I throw that into an array that I end up sending up to my monitoring server. Um, but now let's talk about some non-traditional ways to measure performance. When we create applications, we have this wonderful vision of our application, right? Just follow the yellow brick road. We know what's best for our users and we know how they need to get to the value. But life happens. Uh, sometimes our applications get a little more complicated. Uh, we hope that this complication leads us to something akin to Dora. Um, they can still navigate. It's a little bit more complicated, but it is possible. But Reality is a little bit more scary. Over years and years, our time in our application evolves in what used to be a yellow brick road to hopping from meatball to meatball in a bowl of spaghetti. And if that wasn't bad enough, sometimes we force our users to do the same thing over and over. Opening a slide out, for example. And what we can see into what the user is doing with Google Analytics, without custom, custom, customization, it doesn't track routing events. So what can we do? With UI Router, we can get a little bit deeper into what our users are actually doing. It's a little bit hard to see, but you can see that by using the state change start and the view content loaded events and get, getting timings, we could actually see how long those state switches take. This lets us not only see how long a given route, route took to render, but if we have any slow resolutions. The same thing can be achieved by adding events to the new component router. Hopefully in the new future, uh, these will be rolled in natively. Angular 1x is most popular for, for, has one popular form of lazy loading, and that's uh, OC lazy load. <laughs> this allows you to actually see, um, actually save time by pulling down assets you don't need, and um, we've all seen the benefits of that. Uh, luckily though, the Angular team wrapped it in Angular 2, and uh, we won't have to use that anymore, I'm sorry. Um, but that is gonna be a fantastic benefit that we could all take advantage of. And this also presents us with some unique possibilities because we often code for resolution, but we forget that users also can have different bandwidths. Just because their phablet has a giant screen doesn't mean we should send them a 4K image. Maybe we should start lowering the, with a lower resolution, progressively upgrade to it. Server-side rendering can take this even further and cut out some of those network trips. We've all built our application on solid design principles. We'll forget that sometimes Maybe we didn't minify our code or gzip everything, we may end up something like this. Incredibly hard to see, but this, this application has 1,350 HTTP requests, is 16 megs, and it took 20 seconds to load. Um, that's a heck of a waterfall. And if you saw that on your first day, you might think, great, let's uh, combine and minify all the things. Um, but that's not good, because if you start spriting all the images, combining and minifying all the JavaScript, and, or maybe you even go so far as to inline everything, you kind of lose sight of what you're really trying to do. And you need to step, take a step back and realize, what do I actually need? Do you need your entire application pulled down on the login screen? When do I actually need it? Can I lazy load some of my assets? Is the user performing some other action that I can um, use to get insights into what they're gonna do next? And how are my users connected? 
These are just a couple things that we could begin to look at that tune performance for the future. Thank you very much.